Dr. Superchai, I would like to once again extend our sincere gratitude to you for an excellent keynote address this morning. I thought it was a wonderful beginning of the conference. And we'd love Thank to ask you a few follow-up um, questions just based on the tremendous knowledge and experience that you're bringing uh, also to the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. First question that I'd like to ask, what role does cultural diplomacy have in overcoming development challenges that arise in multilateral trade negotiations? According to my own experiences, I don't think uh, we have developed the uh, instrument of cultural diplomacy in trade negotiations uh, very, very far. Uh, I can I can only uh, uh, cite uh, uh, two examples uh, wherein uh, maybe some forms of cultural diplomacy has been uh, adopted. One one is in the area of uh, agriculture negotiation. Okay. When when you discuss agriculture, then people tend to uh, uh, to base their arguments on their their cultural background, and uh, one of the countries that has made most use of this is uh, is Japan. Uh, Japan uh, is one of the uh, uh, most protected countries in terms of, uh, of agricultural trade, and they call it uh, that uh, they need to protect their own agriculture sector because of the multifunctional role of agriculture. And multifunctional role of agriculture means not only uh, does agriculture sector produce food for consumption? But they are parts of the uh, 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 of the uh, of, of the culture of the Japanese culture, uh, and and so uh, they have to maintain some of the uh, farms and, uh, and 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 some of the uh, the way they produce their own grains. Uh, that is part of the uh, the heritage of the Japanese. I I I have actually had the same kind of argument from President Chirac. Okay when I met him on the friend position on agriculture, and he made use of the same argument that because uh, France uh, has cultural diversity, and uh, if you're all enjoying the French landscapes and countryside, it's mainly because we, we, we protect our farmers. And so this is, was also used by, by President Chirac as well. This is the first area that I thought has come closest to, uh, to cultural diplomacy that's being used in, in trade negotiation. The second area is in the areas of uh, um, uh, what they call the uh, 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 the uh, protection, uh, the, 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 the trade-related intellectual property rights, uh, the, the TRIPS agreement. And, and one of the application of TRIPS was in the areas of geographical indication, okay. uh, the indications. Uh, uh, so, uh, for example, Parmaham. Parmaham uh, could only be produced in Parma to be called Parmaham, and so because well, it's a soil, it's a, it's a I don't know, it's a, the, the, the animals. And even if you export Parma ham to some other European countries and, 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 and you slide them there, they don't call it Parma ham. Okay. It has to be slide in Parma to be called Parma ham. So again, they use a cultural background as a, you know, as a way to, to ascertain the, uh, the niche of, the, of those products. So I can I can say that in, in these two areas, but they all link to agriculture, and of course they were talking about the, the spirits, the, uh, the 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 drinks as well in terms of protection of, of uh, geographical indications. Uh, I, I I can I can uh, say that these are only the areas. Otherwise, uh, I, I don't see much of this uh, being okay. practiced. No, it's quite interesting. Maybe as a follow-up question, you touched on this a little bit. Do different cultures approach such negotiations in a different cultural manner? Uh, is it very noticeable when you're actually there doing the negotiations? Uh, they, they, they do. Uh, they do. Uh, uh, I, I would say, if I, if I compare, in the uh, there used to be, a, there used to be a court, uh, a court uh, group, U.S., Canada, uh, Europe, Japan, okay. and and in the courts you would see uh, the different uh, uh, kind of approach being adopted by the U.S., by the Canadian, by the European, and by the Japanese. For example, the uh, the U.S. would be very forthright. Uh, uh, with a way that they would drive forward in the in the areas of of of, of, of liberalization, particularly in the, again in, in agriculture, Japan is always almost always reticent. I would say that even sometimes Japan would hide behind the arguments of uh, of the European Union uh, to 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 maintain their their protection of uh, of agriculture sector. Canada in those days was already on their own. Uh, Canada has a different system of what they call supply management. Uh, Canada would actually control the production of certain products and certain subsidies on 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 their own. So they have a different uh, system. You see, cotton used to be uh, the kind of products I could say uh, based on their cultural background. The cotton been produced, they weave their own clothes and everything. 
cotton was actually introduced into the uh, Doha development agenda, mainly driven by the uh, cotton producing countries from Africa. So again, I can, I can uh, ascertain that uh, there are some, some cultural backgrounds that could influence the way they negotiate and it could actually become part of the negotiation subsequently. Yes, yeah. Quite interesting, especially thank you for mentioning the different examples in particular. Yes, uh, Maybe I'll ask you one more question about cultural diplomacy and then I'll give my colleagues a chance that they can yes. pose some questions as well. Does cultural diplomacy have a role in helping to enforce agreements that have been passed but not yet put into practice? Um, uh, that is a little bit more, more complicated and uh, more sensitive. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the implementation of some of the uh, trade-related intellectual property rights agreement uh, has been uh, uneven and uh, many times Asian economies are being blamed for uh, not fully uh, uh, disciplining uh, the implementation of, of the TRIPS rules. Now, uh, whether the, uh, the, the cultural background uh, and, and diplomacy would have helped, uh, there has been uh, uh, a lot of uh, exchanges between Asian economies and Western uh, producers uh, of, of some of the, uh, let's say, in the, the, the musical uh, equipments, musical tapes and, 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 and CDs, DVDs, and uh, that are supposed to be uh, copied and counterfeited in, in, in Asia. Uh, whether it's uh, to deal with the, uh, the, the, the back background of Asian producers where a lot of things are being copied and, and, and being brought to the market, uh, I would say, yes, yeah, sometimes it has some elements there. We, we worked a lot on how to deal with the, 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 the corruption practices uh, that I would say exist in, uh, in, in, in most countries in, around the world, but uh, particularly in Asia, uh, it seems to me that uh, sometimes cultural background allows those who commit uh, uh, the uh, malfeasance, uh, they allow them too much uh, latitude to, to, to avoid uh, punishment. Mm. So uh, uh, cultural diplomacy would mean in this area that uh, uh, the peer pressure uh, and, 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 and the, the, the need to be able to enhance the, the positive side of cultural background in a way that uh, uh, people cannot uh, uh, face up to the, uh, uh, the, the peer pressure if, if they deem to be losing face, if they commit something wrong and they're not punished. I think uh, this, could have, this could have been applied more uh, to use peer pressure. But when, when, when I was in the, uh, in the government, we used to apply the, the rules and regulation and legal entity. It was, it was not always very effective. Uh, and I, I do think that some of this implementation of the rules would be more useful if, uh, if some of the cultural background could be could be brought forward uh, to uh, to name and shame people and and for them to move uh, into uh, to create more discipline. I think and and, and for 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 those uh, in Asia, I think the discipline in terms of application of the uh, of the legal uh, framework must be. Uh, must be able to uh, to make use of some of the uh, the cultural uh, uh, possibilities. Yeah, I would True. Say. No, no, I fully yeah. agree. Uh, oh, maybe I'll give my colleagues a chance now if uh, you'd like to pose some, some questions. Um, well, I was wondering what kind of um, roles and responsibilities you might think that uh, you know you, you you mentioned it in your speech that uh, corporate social responsibility has yes. and and what uh, what role can they play in in going in and to a, under to, or a less developed country? Well, I, I, I worked under the, uh, the UN uh, uh, program, uh, which is called uh, Global Compact. Uh, Global, Global Compact is a, is a program which brings together the uh, uh, private sector side mm. together with the UN agencies. And uh, we try to discuss, for example, the issues of responsible investment that investments uh, uh, will have to uh, uh, generate jobs and make use of the, the resources from the countries and enhance the quality of products from those countries, transfer technology that can be used and things like that, and not just to be there uh, to exploit the cheap labor force and so like. Mm. So, so we, we made use of some of the, uh, the principles that we have actually uh, adopted through uh, uh, the, the UN system like on, on responsible investment. But 
in, in some other areas that uh, I used to work with the, uh, with the corporate uh, society, it's in the areas of pharmaceutical production as well. Uh, th there has been uh, a discussion through the World Trade Organization and us at the Antad that uh, pharmaceutical firms should be able to help to meet with the requirements uh, of, of the poor nations, particularly when it comes to essential medicine. Essential medicine means that, that medicine that could be uh, made use of by the bulk of the population uh, in the poor countries, for example, in the treatment of malaria, tuberculosis, uh, the stomach uh, fever, uh, the, the HIV AIDS, and, and this medicine should be, uh, uh, should be uh, available at uh, affordable prices. Otherwise, otherwise, pharmaceutical firms should grant uh, the kind of uh, uh, compulsory licensing so that uh, countries involved with the pandemics could adopt their own generic drugs producing practices to help uh, uh, to deal with the uh, crisis of uh, pandemics. So I think these are some areas which we, we have been trying to, to, to introduce uh, uh, the corporate social responsibility into the, into the, into the uh, poor countries. That was another effort uh, because you see a lot of advanced countries, multinational firms are investing in Africa uh, to source energy. And, and some minerals. And uh, uh, through the so-called uh, extract, Extractive uh, Industry Transparency International, EITI, which is located in Norway and supported by the UN system, we have asked countries, both the countries that, that send the, in the investment uh, firm and the host country that hosts the investment together to determine the practices of the multinational firms in a way that all the benefits from extraction of minerals and energy could be shared with the indigenous people, because most of the time, when people invest in certain areas, they get out all the oil and, and minerals, and they leave big holes there, and, and the region doesn't, doesn't get anything. Neither does the country. So uh, with the introduction of some of the UN principles and guidelines, uh, we have been uh, uh, gradually working through this Global Compact program to bring the, uh, the corporates into the, into the, into the fold of, of corporate social responsibility. It's fascinating. Thank you. Yes. I'll pass it on. Question I'd like to ask uh, if we have the time. Ladies first. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I would like to go back to the Occupy Wall Street movement, yes, uh, okay. which has spread all around the world. Uh, how much uh, potential does cultural diplomacy have, in your opinion, uh, for this, for the challenge it represents, the 1%, the 99% against the 1%, mm -hmm. and maybe in a broader way to the future of global economics? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, the social unrest uh, that we see uh, around the world, uh, they, they, they have uh, a few common uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, first, it's the, uh, the issue of joblessness, uh, lack of uh, unemployment and decent jobs. Second is the, uh, the, the lack of, uh, of, of social protection uh, for those who become unemployed and cannot send their children to school, for example. And third is the dissatisfa dissatisfaction with the uh, political governance of the countries, or economic governance of the countries. They, they don't feel that politicians are really responding to the, you know, to the uh, plights of, the, uh, of the, uh, the underprivileged people. So uh, these are some of the common... I, I, I wouldn't say that uh, there are some cultural uh, background to some of these protests, because sometimes people say, why Arab Spring? I said, no, Arab Spring just just took place in some Arab countries, but the same kind of Arab Spring demonstrations are happening in more than 300 cities around the world. And Occupy Wall Street or demonstration in, in, in Asia, uh, they, 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 they are cross-cutting. They're not only based on, 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 on some, some, some culture. But uh, if we talked about cultural uh, uh, diplomacy uh, to, to, to sort the issues, then, then there might be so that uh, if, when I was talking this morning about social values, yes. uh, in terms of dealing with the, uh, let's say, the bankers in Asia, it seems that the social values in Asia that put the bankers into some, some straitjacket, uh, they seem to be more or less on the on the moderation path. They don't go for the extreme. They don't boast. They don't boast very much when they earn, let's say, a few millions of of, of, of dollars uh, bonuses every year, tens of million every year. They don't. They don't go for that. And, and for it, it, it's for them a, a bit of a shame if they, if they would earn so, so much money like that. So 
So I think, uh, in a way, the kind of uh, social value which uh, in Asian countries, in my own country, in Thailand, uh, His Majesty the King has advised people to adopt the moderation path, what he calls sufficient, sufficiency economics, so that people can, 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 can uh, be less excessive in whatever they do, in consuming, in, uh, in, in advertising, in doing projects not too large. So, so moderation as a, as a cultural background could be actually used uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as one of the means to, to yes. explain to other people that this is a way that we can sort out some of the Occupy Wall Street demonstrations. Thank you. Okay. Maybe a final question? Um, the former Prime Minister of Iceland just recently went on trial for his role in the global yeah, economic yes, crisis. Yes, yes. What kind of message do you think it sends to the West in terms of other countries, especially developing countries? Uh, this is I, I, I still feel that of course politicians can commit uh, can, can can commit commit some mistakes, but I don't think I don't think the former his prime minister or president prime minister, I'm not sure about that. Pre, I think President Harder of of, 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 of of Iceland. I don't think he commit any any um, uh, uh, misdemeanor. He he didn't he, he didn't steal money from the people. You see, when politicians commit some, some, some wrong policies, I don't think they should be punished like that. Uh, I, I'm all in favor of punishing politicians in a very harsh way when they, when they steal money from the people like that. But for the case of Iceland, I think it has been a, a, a long-term practice because Iceland has been always a small economy depending only on fishing and very few people. The, the, the whole mistakes was committed by the, by, the, by the national policy of allowing too fast liberalization of their own financial system. As I was saying this morning, the financial system has become the lifeline of the, of the, of, of, of the, of the economy without having the system producing any facilities or backup for the fishing industries or, I don't know, for the geothermal industries for, or for the housing. Housing, they, they did, but because of the influx of the funds. So the size of the economy doesn't justify the kind of fund uh, mobilization that the, 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 the Icelandic banks have been mobilizing. And I don't think it's a, it's a fall of one prime minister or leader, but it's a fall of the whole. The central bank should be at fault also. Why did they allow the commercial banks to go and source their, their deposits from England, from Norway, from the Scandinavian countries, and to invest hugely into, into the, the real estates that could not be bought by the people? So I, I think it's a it's a general mismanagement of the of the financial policies that you cannot can, you cannot punish uh, anyone. I I, I I was in Korea and also uh, I've been involved with some of the, uh, f the, res the the solution to the financial crisis in Asia. Now Korean uh, system is very harsh on on wrongdoing uh, leaders. They they punish them very well, but. In the case of the financial crisis in 1997-98, they didn't punish anyone. They said this is a collective national mismanagement of the financial system in uh, in uh, in in, uh, in, in uh, not allowing the uh, the won to uh, to be more flexible, or in allowing some of the uh, the shabo to be making use of huge funds and then to spawn all kind of investment. It was a national policy, it's not 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 a wrongdoing of any anybody. So they have actually exempted uh, uh, all the politicians from, from, from the mistake. Whereas in my own country, in Thailand, we took a, f uh, uh, a number of central bankers to task, and some of them were actually uh, 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 judged to be, uh, to be uh, wrongdoing, and, and, and uh, they were declared to be bankrupt. Although as a central banker, again, he didn't, he didn't do any malfeasance with a, the with a fund. He just adopted the, 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 the kind of wrong policy in fixing the bar to the dollar and not allowing the bar to, de to, to devalue earlier. And we lost most of our uh, reserves. So I, I, I don't think it's really fair for only Mr. Harder to be judged uh, to be in the wrong, but I think it's a whole collection of different policy makers uh, from all parts of the economy of Iceland. One last follow-up question. Um, a lot of people say that sometimes democracy doesn't go hand in hand with economic development, and a case in point would be the flying geese in Asia. Yeah, and Singapore, uh, issue, Singapore, yeah. South yeah. Korea, Taiwan. Yeah. And one of the reasons for the success, people say, is that because they were authoritarian first, they were able to focus on economic development, and then they yeah. were able to bring democracy in once the the foundation was laid. Yeah. How do we respond? To I I, that I think the, the criticism? yeah the economic economic rationale, and I I was part of some of the. You know, Asian practices in, in, in those days. I, 
I think people, I think probably misunderstood what Lee Kuan Yew said about guided democracy. Uh, maybe so in the in the in, in Singapore because in Singapore the most democracy is more guided than elsewhere. But it seems to me that economic explanation of that is what I said again this morning that we need to have a balance between the state role and the market role. And Asian economies seem to understand that better than the rest. And here I'm not saying uh, personally. This is my colleagues at the UN who are saying this to me because I was in in Asia. People use a lot of state role. Even if in market economy, most Asian economies have national plans, for example. If you have market economy, why should you need a national plan? But Asian use national plans to be just only a, a, a guideline. They don't, unlike in the planned economy, they don't, they don't impose the plans on the, on, the, on, the, on the people and on the parties, but they give the guideline. Uh, for example, the, the automobile industry in Thailand came up from nowhere. Thailand is now one of the largest automobile producers in Asia and, and Thailand export to more than 100 countries uh, their automobile and it came from nowhere but it came with a guideline from the government that liberalized all the trade in the areas of spare parts of the of the of the automobile and that has spawned a lot of spare parts producers and from the spare part producers we have been completely building up the whole car and so uh, it, 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 it didn't come from the market itself but it came from the ex explicit uh, policy by the government to allow spare part producers to be to be liberal, the way they can compete with the rest, and so they became very strong, and and we were sourced in terms of the major spare parts for for car produced in Japan, United States, in Europe, and and later on they said, well, if you have all these spare parts, we build the whole car in, in Thailand. So Japan now build cars in Thailand, United States build cars in Thailand to be exported to Japan, to be exported to Europe and United States. So I think it's a it's a it's a, it's a combination of a balanced role between the state. And, and, and market. That's why the Asian economies are known for their so-called industrial policies. Industrial policy was rejected by the Bretton Woods institution in the 70s and the 80s as being too protectionist. But the point was not to, to be protectionist. The point was to help experiment with certain industries that could have backward and forward linkages in the countries. If they succeed, they go ahead. If they don't succeed, the government just, just drop the uh, support. So it's not, it was not a blind support of the industrial policies that have actually made successful industrialization process in Korea and Japan. In both countries, you can see after the Second World War, Japan was successful in industrialization because of the setting up of the industrial, poly, industrial development bank, the industrial development bank, and long-term credit bank in Japan. They were all set up with the explicit mind of the government to support industrialization policy, same as in Korea. So Sorry, much, thank, you so you very, no, thank you very, very much for your perspectives in the interview as well as the lecture. We really appreciated it. An honor to get to know you in person, and I think there's a strong future <laughs> see, for yeah. cultural diplomacy and developments to go ahead. I, uh, yeah, I will so. be looking forward more to adopting that and to learning for, for, for what you are doing here in, uh, in Berlin on the, the cultural diplomacy side. Thank you again for the honor of having well, me. Yes. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you.